This week on Q&A, our guest is Walt Mossberg, personal technology columnist for The Wall Street Journal. Walt Mossberg and your column, Personal Technology, on Thursday of this week. The headline is, In Browser Wars, the new Firefox loses some edge. How is the average person supposed to understand what that column's all about? Well, hopefully, Brian, the average person will understand it because I try and have, have tried since I started writing those columns a long time ago to write them in English and to write them conversationally. So compared to what you might read on a more uh, techie-oriented uh, website, for instance, uh, I am uh, I, I'm stopping to explain terms. I'm uh, uh, pretending I'm talking to a smart person, but somebody who's not a techie and not interested in being a techie. What motivated you to write about Firefox and what is it? Well, Firefox is the second most popular web browser in the world. And Obviously, web browsing is an enormously important activity uh, engaged in by uh, all layers of society, and uh, there needs to be a competition, just like there needs to be a competition in TV sets or any other gateway into a medium. A web browser is a gateway into a medium, and Firefox is the principal competitor to Microsoft's Internet Explorer, which I've also gone into great detail in reviewing. And there are, is actually a new browser war going on. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a browser war. Microsoft won decisively against a small outfit called Netscape. And uh, now there's a new browser war. And there are four principal combatants in that war. Uh, and Firefox is one of them. And so when any of them bring out a brand new web browser, there's a lot of interest among my readers in, well, what's different about it? Should I switch to it? Is it slower? Is it faster? Has it got different features? So it's a good topic for me to write about. What has been your reaction to the fact that you personally, after, what is it, 18 years of writing? This about column, 17 and a half, yeah. Have become a personality? Uh, well, I'm a personality in a certain world. Um, I can walk down the streets here in Washington and loads of people, most people, you know, have no idea who I am, but it's a little different if I'm uh, at a computer trade show or something where a lot more people do know who I am. So my reaction is it sort of comes with the territory, and, and you certainly understand that as well. Well, you've had a New Yorker profile and Wired magazine stories and other magazine stories, and one of the things that uh, I think it was Ken Oletta and the New Yorker called you was a curmudgeon. Yeah, well, that's commonly used to apply to me. I guess uh, it's because um, uh, I don't always give everything a good review. That review this morning, I mean, Firefox is a cult beloved product. I use it myself. And I thought this particular new release uh, wasn't quite as good at advancing their position as some of their previous releases. So uh, somewhere along the line, I picked up that, that uh, title of curmudgeon. How often do you write? Uh, I write uh, two columns a week and uh, I also have uh, working for me a terrific young woman named Catherine Barrett who writes a third column that I edit but don't write and it's really her work. So I write two and I edit one every week and then I, uh, when the spirit moves me, I uh, do a blog post on a website that I a co-manage. Back in 1995, we did a little interview over at the Bureau, and I want to show you what you sounded like, looked like, and also what we were talking about and talk about the change. Sounds frightening. <laughs> All right, let's take somebody like me. I, I just happened to have bought my first ever computer not more than three months ago, and it's one of those little laptop you know, jobs you can take around with you and plug in and C-SPAN went on America Online on December the 1st, and so I can go home and plug in, or I can take it anywhere I want to and plug in and find right. out the C-SPAN schedule. Um, what about somebody like me? What's the, what would you tell me if I had never touched a computer? How would I get started in figuring out why I should even have one? 
Well, the first thing I tell everybody, and I, and I write this, and I also say it personally to people, is figure out what you want to do with it. In other words, the idea that I just want to work a computer, I want to become, quote, computer literate, is, is good for the hype and ad campaign of the computer industry, but it's not good for you because you're busy, you're smart about what you know, and you don't necessarily want to take up a second career unless it, it's your hobby. Uh, so the first question is, what do I want to do with it? In your case, I think from what you said, you wanted to write some probably, and you wanted to be able to log on to America Online, which is an online service with lots of information, including now a, a section for C-SPAN. Uh, and you're probably traveling to some extent, so you wanted something portable. So uh, once you get that figured out, then I think what you need to do is go for the best combination of not only price and power, but one factor that people tend not to consider a lot, which is ease of use ease of use. How quickly can you, after you turn it on, can you get into doing productive work without having to learn a lot of techno babble? Reaction? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, those glasses were pretty big. <laughs> I guess that's my reaction. Um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, both of us would have the same point of view today. Um, you bought a computer at that time. I would point out, Brian, that the personal computer really went uh, mass market in 1977, and that was, what, 94. So it took you a while to buy a your computer. A little behind, yes. Uh, but you bought a computer then. You've probably bought a number of them since then, and you still want to do a, a lot of the same things. Uh, for my part, I would say, I still say the same things to pe people. I mean, the most important thing is, what do you, whoever I'm talking to, and including my readers, want to do with the computer. And there are different kinds of computers now, including uh, things like this iPhone, which uh, uh, you know, is actually a computer, not really a phone. It's a computer that happens to make phone calls. And uh, it has more power, I'm sure, than that laptop you bought uh, back in 94 and 95. When I, I found it interesting. I was obsessed with the fact that we could get our schedule out. I mean, that was the only thing that mattered at that time. Uh, but there's another clip I want to show you from that interview that uses language of products, and you tell us what's happened to these. Okay. America Online, I think, is basically the most economical. For $9.95 a month, you get five hours and, the, and those hours can be spent on any feature of the service. They can get our schedule on America Online. They can get your schedule, but uh, they can get a lot of other things. On Prodigy, you pay $14.95 a month, but once you've used two hours, uh, certain parts of the service, like the bulletin board, start costing you extra, and then there are other things that cost even above that. CompuServe is $8.95, and you get a bunch of basic services after that, however, it may cost you $8 an hour, or if you have a high-speed modem, $16 an hour. What happened to AOL, Prodigy, and CompuServe? Well, Prodigy died, and that was a deserved death because they were uh, more of a one-way broadcast service, not very attuned to users wanting to contribute. Uh, CompuServe was acquired by AOL, uh, AOL had been the upstart around that time. CompuServe and Prodigy were the leaders, uh, but eventually AOL bought CompuServe, and then you know AOL um, uh, bought Time Warner, and the merger kind of fell apart, and now Time Warner is spinning it off again, uh, and it probably is going to be reborn in some other way. It certainly is uh, has nowhere near the power it, it had in those days, but I think one of the interesting things was you noticed I was explaining the pricing and the pricing was metered pricing. You got so many hours for so many dollars and then maybe so many features and then it went up. And of course, uh, just a few years after that, the World Wide Web uh, became open to people and came into existence. And except for the fee you have to pay every month for access, uh, which, uh, can be forty, fifty dollars a month. It's not cheap. Uh, the actual use of the content on there is not metered by time or by uh, by what you're doing for the most part. And this is right at the heart of a gigantic 
debate uh, and a gigantic business issue right now. Which is what? Well, the issue is uh, uh, if you're producing a service or content like the Wall Street Journal or C-SPAN or um, you know NBC or CBS or uh, a, a very good blog or whatever, um, uh, can you charge people for it? Uh, can you sell enough advertising to make make your profit, cover your costs, make your profit? And there's a big debate. And uh, we at the Wall Street Journal are almost alone. Uh, there are a couple of others like Consumer Reports, but we're almost alone in taking the point of view that uh, we're doing a mixed model. Some things we have are free and some things we have require subscription just like the printed newspaper does. What does it cost to subscribe online to the Wall Street Journal? I honestly don't know. Uh, I'm not in the sales side of it. I, I, my sense of it is it's something on the order of $100 a year, but it can be a little less in combination. You know, they run offers, and if you're a print subscriber, it's less. So I, I don't know. But I think it's somewhere in the order of $100 a year. Last time I saw something like 800,000 subscribers? Or is it oh, it's a million. It's oh, about it's a, a million. million, yeah. What about Walt Mossberg's life? Go back to 1995 where we were. Uh, what has changed in your life besides the fact that Rupert Murdoch owns the Wall Street Journal? Uh, I've been very lucky, uh, uh, both in my work and in my, in my personal life. I mean, uh, my kids are grown up. Uh, one of them is going to get married uh, next year, so that's a great thing. How old are they? Uh, one is 30 and one is 27. Um, the, uh, I've now, as we said a minute ago, I now write several columns. I think at the time we were talking, I wrote one. Uh, I, I do have a, a, an excellent colleague, a young colleague that works uh, for me, uh, who gives me uh, a, a female and a younger perspective, which are really helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went through, like everyone else, various health things that I've thankfully come through, and that's been good. So, uh, uh, but probably the most interesting thing I've done. Uh, is uh, about seven years ago, uh, a, a, another Wall Street Journal columnist named Kara Swisher and I started a, uh, a conference called the D Conference, All Things Digital. And uh, that brings together sort of the leaders of the technology industry and also the media industry to talk about these issues like how do you make money, does everything have to be free, is there an advertising market online, and more to the point, what are the technologies of the future? And that conference has been very successful, and it has spawned a website that I now co-produce with Kara called uh, uh, allthingsd.com. So I still write my columns in the journal. They still are my main job, and I still enjoy doing them. But I'm also now a little bit of an entrepreneur in the sense that um, uh, although uh, the journal owns the conference and the website, uh, Kara and I... Uh, run them kind of autonomously, and that's been a really interesting experience. All Things Digital, the conference, it was conducted when in June this year? Uh, this year it was conducted, it, it's always conducted right after uh, Memorial Day, so it was really at the very end of May, not, uh, not may have ended on June 1st. Well, here's some video, I think it's from this year, tell me if it's, I think this is from the May 2009 conference, and it's Kara Swisher, but I, I, I want to show this because then also in the New Yorker, uh, he talks about a personal relationship you have to the situation. Let's watch this. On my way down here, I drove down in my, my minivan type of car with Ed, my assistant, and my mom, who comes to, who's come to every year to D, and she hands out swag. I hope she was polite to you all. That's a, that's a big hope. Um, so, um, <laughs> no kidding. She was great. Good. Excellent. Good service from the Swisher family. So, um, so she, I interviewed her in a gas station about Twitter. I've been, I was asking her if she, if she tweeted. And here's the uh, movie I made. As you know, I always make these movies and assault people, and I was assaulting my mom this time. So here's Kara's mom on Twitter. Okay. Yes. Here we are in California, rural <laughs> California. Yes. Yeah. Do you Twitter? No. Why not? <laughs> are you crazy? Why not? I don't even <laughs> use. Yeah, but what, what do you think of Twitter? I don't know. Why, why would I want people to know what I'm doing? Because we like to overshare the internet. Well, I'm sorry, it's nobody's business. <laughs> tweet right now, if you would. Tweet? Yep, 140 characters, what would you tweet? What do you 
are you talking about? <laughs> That's all you have to tweet. Oh, Mom. Why would I want to do that? Excellent. Thanks, Mom. Time. Well, it's going to be sold for a zillion dollars. Well, good. Lucky then. <laughs> You know, the you know, some people think people like us in the media are elitist, but we're not. We're with the people. There's, there's the people. Yeah. Voice of the people. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So, uh, what did she use? The flip camera? She used the flip. Yeah. Now that yeah. didn't exist. In fact, we it. gave away a flip camera to everyone at our conference this year. So, what's the? Uh, is, did we get a good taste of what uh, Kara Swisher's mother's like? Yeah. I think you did. She's feisty. She's smart. She's not techy. She's not into technical things. She, you know, I, as far as I know, she doesn't use a computer or anything like that. What did? You, how much have you heard responses like her response to this thing called Twitter? Well, look, Brian. One of the great fun things about writing about technology is there's something new all the time, and some of these are just new gimmicks, and some of them stick. And social networking is something that I think is going to stick, but it has different forms and different people try their hands at different ways of doing it. And Twitter is the, the kind of flavor du jour. Uh, it's, uh, uh, for those watching this who don't know, it's a uh, social networking service where you really uh, are just sending out bursts of information, 140 characters is all you can type. In fact, in our program book for the conference, are little biographies of the two founders of Twitter, who were the guys we were interviewing there on stage, were limited to 140 characters. Um, so uh, people talk about, sometimes somebody says, oh, I just had oatmeal for breakfast. Personally, I don't care about that. But uh, other people um, have actually been the first to report news or make pithy and interesting comments about uh, things going on in, in, in public events. Some of, some of them maybe you're... C-SPAN viewers who saw some interview on here and tweeted, as the term goes, a comment, a quick comment about it. When did Twitter start? And I know in watching some of your conference, uh, they're not making any money. Right. It started, I don't know the exact date, I think a couple of years ago, No, probably no more than that. Uh, and it's unlike some people have heard of MySpace or Facebook, some of these other social networks, or even going back to that really old tape we showed, uh, AOL, you know, had chat rooms where, back in those days, where people got to meet each other. Um, unlike those, on Twitter, you don't develop, quote, friends, you develop followers. So people, if they think your tweets, your messages are interesting enough, can just click and follow you, and then they see all your messages. And uh, it's tough for them to figure out a way to make money. They've been given a lot of money by investors, by venture capitalists, and they have plenty of it uh, to build it and to uh, uh, hire people. But um, they haven't, so far as I know, started running ads or doing or charging anything for it. And they, uh, we question them quite a bit at our conference because our conference is a journalistic conference where no one's allowed to make a speech, no one's allowed to show slides. We just interview them on stage. And uh, we mentioned many times, how are you going to make money? What's the, you know? And they said, well, we have a lot of data about our users. Maybe there's some way with the user's permission for us to, you know, find some way to make money using that. But they were kind of vague about it. And th they didn't, I mean, I know I watched it. They didn't say they knew how they were going to make money on it. Right. Do you think they do? No, I, I think they don't know how they're going to make money. I think they have more ideas of it than they were willing to say on stage at our conference. You said they, they only had 43 know. people working for them? Yeah, something like how that. How do you do something this global with 43 people? Well, because the users do all the work. And that's, it's called a UCG, user, uh, UGC, user-generated content. Same as YouTube. I think there are people sitting around Google producing all those videos of cats on skateboards. Those are done by average people. So uh, they're not producing any content for Twitter. It is expensive, and it does take some work, uh, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's not simple to uh, operate the servers and keep the system going. I don't mean they do nothing. They certainly do a lot of you know, under-the-hood stuff, but the actual creation of the content is done by users. I want to read this 
paragraph, and uh, it's very personal in Ken Auletta's piece on you, uh, which, what, he ran in 207? Two, uh, yeah. Mossberg is not shy about expressing his opinions. He helped recruit Kara Swisher from the Washington Post in late 1996 and encouraged her to move to Silicon Valley. By the way, where is Silicon Valley? Just south of San Francisco, between San Francisco and San Jose. What's there? Most of the, it's, it's probably the biggest concentration of uh, companies in the internet and technology. You know, Intel is there, Hewlett Packard, Apple, Palm, Google, Twitter, all these companies are there. I know one of your bosses wanted you to move there and you said no way. Yeah, that's a different story, but. You stay here because? I stay here because I want the consumer focus always to be first in my mind. And, and I go to Silicon Valley quite often. I'm, I'm there six, seven times a year. I, I know how to drive through those streets almost as well as I know how to drive around here in Washington. But I was extremely concerned that if I lived among the industry, I would become uh, kind of infused with the industry mindset. And it's not that there's anything evil about that. It's just that uh, I wanted to stay uh, infused with the consumer mindset, so I stayed here. Uh, this goes on to say, when she met Megan Smith, a, global, a Google executive, decided to marry, Swisher told her mother uh, was troubled by the idea of a gay wedding. That's in quotes. She and Smith have two children, and she recalls that when she came home with her first baby, Mossberg was there, and so was her mother, who really likes Walt a lot. Swisher went on. We were having dinner, and she was being difficult. She was arguing with me. I was getting really uncomfortable. Walt took her down like I've never seen anybody take anybody down. How dare you talk to her like this? This is an important issue, and you have to be supportive no matter what as a parent. My mother just was shocked and he was relentless in not letting her off the hook. Explain that. Uh, well, I wish Kara hadn't, uh, hadn't told that to the New Yorker for that story. Uh, I like uh, uh, Kara's mom. Uh, we're on good terms today. We were on good terms before that. We, uh, and, and it was just one of those moments when uh, I came to the defense of a friend. That's all I mean, you know. These things happen in families when uh, new babies uh, are involved. I mean, she's crazy about the, the kids, by the way. Uh, she takes care of them quite a lot because both Karen and Megan work, you know, uh, heavy hour jobs. And uh, she's a wonderful grandmother. And um, I guess that's all I want to say about well, it. Well, actually, the main reason I ask is because here again, here you are, a you know, your personal life is being written about and you're just a technology writer. Although, just a technology writer, they say you make a lot of money. I'm just a technology writer and you, you are just a television guy and yet everyone knows you and who, particularly people who are interested in the things C-SPAN covers and lots of people know who I am or think they know more about me than they do because they're interested in what I write about. Give us an example of where, and it could be more than one, companies have really come at you desperately wanting your endorsement. And what do you do personally? How do you, is that where the curmudgeon thing comes in? You just push back? Well, first of all, I don't endorse in the sense of, you know, putting a blurb on a box of something. Um, People can run quotes from my reviews because that's fair use under the copyright laws in the First Amendment, but I don't ever agree to endorse, you know, this product is endorsed by Walt Mossberg. I don't do that. That's a, that would be unethical journalistically and it would be unethical under the rules of the Wall Street Journal and my own personal uh, uh, ethics. But um, it's just like being a, a movie reviewer. I mean, I'm an opinion columnist, Brian. I'm not a reporter. I used to be a reporter at one time, but I am a, a columnist who is paid to write opinions, who is paid to be subjective. I test these products, and then I tell people what I think about them. Which one should you buy? Which one should you not buy? What are the strengths of this? What are the weaknesses of it? So, uh, but I have a big audience, so people want to uh, have put their product in front of me. And I do, I spend, I, I will spend uh, the rest of this day, once we're done here, meeting with companies, looking at their products. And some of them I'll write about, some of them I won't, some of them I will give a good review to, and some of them I will give a kind of 
middle of the road review to, and once in a while I'll give a really bad review to something. And uh, so companies pitch me. There's nothing. It's not. There's nothing sort of nefarious. Nobody tries to muscle me. They just pitch me. Uh, they'll come. They'll say, "Here's this new gadget, or this new website, or this new computer, or whatever it is, a digital camera," and uh, I'll take a look at it. Well, they do say you make and break products. Do you feel I've that way? I've never said that. No, I didn't say you did, but they, <laughs> you know, people are writing all the time. And, yeah, I don't believe that. Um, be, look, it's perfectly obvious that if you are someone whose name is well known as, let's say, a movie, movie reviewer, and your movie reviews appear in a trusted and well known and widely read publication, uh, that if you like a movie, that will help ticket sales in the movie, and if you don't like a movie, it will probably hurt them. And that's sort of the analogy here. Um, obviously, if I say Firefox is the best browser and I recommend you use it and not use this other one, which I, is the kind of thing I sometimes say, um, some percentage of people who wouldn't otherwise have done so will go get it. And if I say this thing is the worst web browser, some percentage of people who might have used it won't use it. But that's not quite the same as saying make and break. I don't believe that. If you go back to what we were talking about earlier, the Prodigy, the CompuServe, they're gone. AOL has not succeeded the way I think they intended to. Uh, looking at what you see in front of you today, things that we all know about, what do you think is going to not make it? And if it, what, what indication do you have that some of these companies will not make it uh, financially? Well, I don't cover the finances of these companies. And I think it's really important for people to understand, particularly technology fans, to understand uh, when, when they are thinking about investments that just because you love the product or just because it looks like a cool product or all your friends are using it doesn't mean that the company is managing the money correctly or is planning the next product correctly or is doing all of the boring non-techie financial and management things. You know, maybe they made a bad deal for memory chips and their competitor is paying less and can underprice them even though the product isn't quite as good. There are millions of these factors, which is why I have never, in the 17 years I've written this column, ever given any investment advice and why I'm not going to start here today. But I would say that most of the tech products that are out there today will fail in the sense that they won't become mega hits and they will be replaced by something else. And a few of them are landmark products that are kind of game changers and change the industry. And, you know, like the original uh, uh, IBM and Apple computers were big deals. They were game changers. The original web browser, uh, things like that. Uh, but those don't come along all the time. I want to show you uh, a clip from our 95 interview where there were a couple of computers in the office there and you'll see All what right. they looked like. Well, right here, uh, in order to do the, do the column, I have the two most common kinds of computers. This happens to be a compact, but it might be any other brand. And it's running Microsoft Windows, uh, which is a, a system that makes IBM compatibles easier to use. And then this is an Apple Macintosh, which is running the Macintosh software. And uh, I use both of them. I write the column uh, alternating and on, on one platform or the other. And I try out software for both kinds of computers. Now, these computers um, operate differently, these two? Well, I mean, for somebody that's never had a right. Compact or an Apple. Right. They, these computers have different uh, operating systems, a program that is a Macintosh program won't run on an IBM compatible and vice versa. However, what's been happening in the last few years is that Apple's approach, which was to use the, the mouse and icons, which are little pictures on the screen that you click to get things done, and to use a lot of plain English lists of commands, that approach has been adopted widely on the IBM PC through this system called Microsoft Windows. And what you wind up with is very similar looking computers now. Uh, and even though a program that's made for one won't run on the other, many companies make two almost identical versions of the same program. So that if I were running, say, the Microsoft Word word processor in Windows and the Microsoft Word word processor in Macintosh, on the screens they look almost identical. 
So what's happened to the Compact, the Apple, uh, the, the Windows, all the different language you Well, use? one thing uh, that I was saying there is still absolutely true today. The two most prominent computer operating systems and the two sort of almost religious rivals here are, are Apple and Microsoft uh, in terms of their operating systems. And there are uh, Apple is a, vertic a vertically integrated company that uh, makes its own, it makes the Mac, the, their computer, and all their other products, and they make the software, the operating system, and all that. Third-party companies can produce programs that run on them that Apple doesn't own or make any money from, but um, they make both the hardware and the software. Microsoft, which is uh, a, a much bigger uh, company, uh, makes. Uh, uh, no hardware, uh, no computers. Uh, I shouldn't. I should say they make a, a small amount of hardware, and they principally make Microsoft Windows still, which is still the dominant operating system, and they make uh, uh, Microsoft Office, which I mentioned there, which includes Word and Excel, and you know all your all all your viewers know that. And uh, so those things are this are similar. Compaq, the particular maker of that computer. You can still buy Compaq computers, but now Compaq is owned by Hewlett Packard and it is merely a brand of Hewlett Packards rather than an independent computer company. Apple, uh, in the time between that tape and today, suffered a near-death experience. Some people say they were within 90 days of Chapter 11, uh, in around 97 or so. And uh, Steve Jobs, who had been one of their founders and who had been thrown out by the guy he brought in to help run the company, uh, was brought back. And he has uh, revived that company pretty spectacularly, if you were an investor in it at least, and uh, produced a series of uh, landmark products in the, whatever it is, 12 years or so since he's been back. Your paper has covered a lot of Steve Jobs and his illness. If Steve Jobs wasn't there, what impact do you think it'd have on the company? Well, it's very hard to say. Um, he's one of these unusual chief, of, chief, chief executive officers, Brian, who uh, tends to be very detail-oriented, and he's a product guy, and he has his hands in a lot of things. Uh, so obviously it wouldn't be a simple matter of replacing a sort of um, a sort of non-assertive CEO. Uh, on the other hand, he's not personally sitting there designing the next iPhone or the next uh, uh, Macintosh. Uh, he, they happen to have a brilliant designer uh, and a design team, and they have a, a COO who has run the company in his during his medical leave of absence who seems, by all, by all outside accounts, to have done very well. Uh, I imagine over time the company would change because he is such a strong personality and a strong presence, but I don't know uh, that you could say the company would fail. It just might be a little different. I don't know. If you had to live with just what you wanted to use and you weren't in this business any longer, what would you have right now in your possession? Meaning everything from your laptop to your yeah, own I'm not going to. I'm not going to. That I'm not going to sit here and endorse a bunch of products. I'm just not going to do that. I I I use uh, every day uh, a a Windows computer and a, a and a Mac, and I use different ones. I I personally own between what I own personally and what the journal owns on my behalf, probably eight or nine computers, roughly split between. Windows and Mac, and um, some are laptops, and a diminishing number are desktops because desktops are kind of going away. But um, I use all of them. And in terms of uh, the device, uh, the, my, my phone, it has changed over the years. I do carry an iPhone right now. I have carried other brands in the past, and I may carry other brands in the future. What about a netbook? And tell us what it, that is. A netbook is a marketing term at the moment. It may someday be a real different kind of animal, but right now it's a marketing term for a an especially small and inexpensive laptop. That's really all it is. If you go to uh, you know Best Buy and you say I want to buy a netbook, they will sell you a small laptop for somewhere between three and five hundred dollars usually running Windows XP, which 
essentially is like any other laptop except it's very small and light and didn't cost you very much money. And, do you and we're in a terrible economy and people do genuinely want something smaller and lighter, people who travel particularly. So the appeal of something that is only a few hundred dollars and is about half the weight of what you might have had before is strong and so they're doing very well. On your website, uh, here's a so you're giving some, some advice, recommendations, and all, and I want to run this, and you can tell us what you do and when you do this. This week, I thought I would talk about just a handful of the ones that I find myself using most often on my iPhone uh, and recommend them to you. Um, and let me just uh, quickly tick off some of them here in this video. Um, a first one I'd, I'd like to mention is called Tweety. If you use Twitter, like I do, and like uh, uh, millions and millions of people do, um, it's good to be able to use it on the go. And there are a bunch of Twitter apps for the iPhone, but Tweety is uh, the one that I like the best. I think it does a great job of letting you uh, make your own posts, read other people's posts, uh, and uh, do searches and do other functions uh, uh, within Twitter. Uh, another closely related app, uh, another social networking app is Facebook. This is officially uh, produced by Facebook itself. Uh, it has it covers all of the core functions of the uh, web-based uh, Facebook uh, service. Um, you know, updating your status messages and your photos, viewing other people's uh, news and viewing their photos, uh, dealing with internal Facebook email and internal uh, Facebook chat. Another app I find myself using a lot is Amazon's Kindle app for the iPhone. This is a free app that performs uh, the basic functions, not all of them, but the basic functions of the Kindle ebook reader hardware that Amazon sells for $360. Um, it can allow you to read on your iPhone the same Kindle books you can read on your Kindle device, and it will even synchronize between a Kindle device and an iPhone if you happen to own both. First, where can people see those kind of recommendations? Well, what that was was me. Uh, that was a week where I chose to write a, write a column recommending um, some iPhone apps. Do you want me to explain what that is? I do. Okay. So, we, the most, I think, the most important uh, hardware technology and in a way also software technology going on right now is the rise of the handheld computer, the super smartphone. Unlike the netbook that we just talked about, which is more of a price play and a size play, this is really a new kind of computer. And I, and I have a few of them here, but you know, the most famous one is the Apple iPhone, uh, which I do carry, um, which by the way, any of these have more power than those computers in my office in 1995. Um, but one of the cool things about these, all of these, this is the Palm Pre, uh, which is a competitor to the iPhone that came out uh, recently. This is a, another relatively new competitor called the uh, uh, Nokia N97. This one has a, a kind of a flip-up screen. Um, and just for historical interest, here's really, I think, the first really good smartphone, the Palm Trio from, I don't know, 10, 10 or years or so ago. Uh, but these iPhone class, let me call it that, iPhone class smartphones, and there are others that I don't have on this table with me, uh, are essentially handheld computers that happen to make phone calls. Now, one of the cool things about them is they are also, like the Windows computer, like the Mac computer, they are platforms for people to write software for useful software that can get things done, that can entertain you, whether it's a spreadsheet or a game or, you know, the C-SPAN schedule, I'm pretty sure, is somewhere on this iPhone. And um, there are, Apple recently announced that after one year of allowing people to write and sell programs for the phone, which are called apps, the word is short for application, and application is the techie's term for a computer program, so apps. After one year of allowing uh, apps on its iPhone product, uh, they now have 65,000 apps available, which is an astonishing thing. 
and they have been downloaded by people, according to Apple, a billion and a half times in that year. Now, many of these are free. A lot of others cost a buck. Some cost as much as 40 bucks, but um, it's, quite a, it's quite astonishing. And so what you saw me doing in that video was talking about some of the apps that I use on my iPhone that I find most useful. Where do you find out where those 65,000 apps, what they do and why you want Oh, uh, Apple has an app store uh, and the app store can be reached either right on the phone by touching an icon, which brings up essentially a catalog of these apps and describes them. In that video, you saw screenshots of like that Kindle and so f uh, app and so forth. Uh, those are in the catalog and you get a chance to read about it. What can it do? Uh, look at what it would look like on your phone, and then you can click and buy it or not buy it. How, how did you And make by the way, you can do the same thing on, your, on your, either your Windows or your Mac computer with the iTunes program, which is pretty widespread. There is a section in that program which, if you click on it, is a catalog of apps for your iPhone. How did you do that video in itself? Did you do that on yeah. your own? Yeah. Couldn't you, did you think the production values were fabulous? Well, I'm not sure that, <laughs> I, I'm not sure the production values matter when you're yeah. looking for information. Um, what I did on that video and what I do every week, I write my column, and this is another change, I guess, from 1995. I write my column, and when I have finished writing my column and filing it to New York to the editors, I then go and sit down in front of one of the computers in my house, which has a built-in camera. Most computers sold today have a built-in camera fire up a program that records video, and I talk into that little camera, as you saw me do there, and then I send the raw video to New York. And at the Wall Street Journal in New York, and this would have been astonishing in 1995, completely unheard of, there is a video production unit that takes that video and puts in uh, B-roll, which is, you know, showing the Kendall and things like showing the things that I'm talking about putting my name, you know, across, uh, to identify me, as I'm sure will happen on, on this program. And uh, I could do that on the computer myself. The software I have has the capability for that. But uh, in my case, I, I send it to them in New York. They do all those things. They then send it back to me. I look at it to make sure it all seems right, and then we publish it on the web. So let's go over where all things Walt Mossberg. Where can what days of the week can they read your column? Uh, if they're a print reader, uh, uh, my two columns, which are called Personal Technology and Mossberg's Mailbox, appear on Thursdays. They appear on the web uh, starting the night before, so Wednesday night at usually around 9 o'clock Eastern, they appear uh, on either the Wall Street Journal website, wsj.com, or the website that the Wall Street Journal owns, but which I run with Kara Swisher, which is called allthingsd.com. Uh, they can also read the, on Wednesdays in print the, a column called The Mossberg Solution, which despite the name, I do not write, and is written by Catherine Barrett. And her column is on the web, and she does a video also every week, and her column is on the web um, Tuesday night on those same two websites. We have some video of her, so let's see what uh, Karen, is it Katie or Karen? Kat Catherine Kat is Catherine. her byline, but she goes by Katie. Let's watch this. Hi, this is Katie Barrett with the Wall Street Journal. It can be really frustrating to type in a search online only to receive hundreds of results that you have to comb through to find exactly what you want. This week I tried two free tools that you can use to improve your searches online. One is from the search giant Google and it is called Search Wiki. It is available for anybody with a Google account and it only works when you're signed into your Google account. Um, search Wiki is something that appears on screen when you conduct a regular Google search. It includes arrows beside each search result, an up arrow, a down arrow, and a little tiny icon that represents notes or comments that you can add to a search result. So what's the point of all these search wiki icons? Well, arrows can be clicked and then a search result shoots to the top of the screen. That means that you value that result. You think it's important for you. Where did you find Katie? Uh, Katie, uh, 
came to me from the University of Delaware uh, as a young woman, and she's still a young woman. And uh, she started as my, uh, what we call reporting assistant, which is just a job title at the journal, which means you do some reporting and you do some clerical things. And uh, she's uh, uh, turned out to be terrific, and she's now a full-fledged uh, reporter at the Wall Street Journal and uh, uh, an employee of mine, and, and uh, she's great. Go back to the All Things Digital Conference. Where was that held? Uh, that conference is held in uh, Carlsbad, California, uh, just outside San Diego at a hotel there. And, um, uh, you know, there's no law that it always will be held there, but it has been held there for the first Who seven years. Who can come years. and what's it cost them? Uh, anyone can come, actually. People think it's invitation only. It's not. Um, it's not cheap. It's a $5,000 ticket uh, to attend the conference. And uh, we tend to have a lot of repeat attendees who enjoy it. Because like any good conference, it's a combination of what's on stage, what am I learning, uh, if anything, from the speakers, but also a lot of networking. Brian, there have been a lot of business deals done in the hallways of that conference that sometimes Karen and I don't find out about till years later and somebody will say, you know, we negotiated this big billion dollar merger, you know, starting at D three years ago or something. And we're like, well, geez, we'd be rich if we could get a cut of that. But of course we, we don't and we can't. How, so. how many days is it? it it's uh, about, it, it stretches over three days, but it's not three full days. It starts in the evening of the first day with a single interview, a dinner and a single interview, uh, and then an entire very long day the next day, and then about half or two-thirds of a day that last day. Does anybody dare say no to you? Sure. People on, say no to me all the time. On the conference, I mean, if you call them up and, and ask them and they just don't show up, and wouldn't that impact you or Kara when, in your writing and coverage? Well, nobody doesn't. Uh, we haven't had a case where somebody has agreed to come and then bailed on us, if that's what you mean. We certainly have had cases where people have said, uh, no thanks, uh, I'd rather not be a speaker, but we're persistent. We go back to them. Um, this year we had the CEO of Nokia, which is in some ways the most important tech company in Europe, and that was about a four-year effort to get the CEO of Nokia to come. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, my boss, my ultimate boss now, when before he bought the Wall Street Journal, declined to be a speaker a couple of times. And even after he bought the Wall Street Journal, I think it took me three months to convince him to come and be a speaker. And he was a terrific speaker, actually. Why do you think you've become so valuable to the newspaper? You know, you'd have to ask the people that run the newspaper. I, I try to do a good job. I have a following. Uh, I think uh, most of the readers uh, uh, find what I write to be useful. And um, beyond that, it's really, you really are asking the wrong guy. You really are well, asking them. I, t take yourself, the name out of it, but put the column in there. And in the last, you know, 17 and a half years, why has this become such an important subject? Oh, well, the subject is, uh, I mean, we are living through one of the periods, one of the greatest periods of technological change uh, in modern history or maybe in all history. And it's confusing to people, lots of aspects of their lives, whether it's uh, uh, getting their news, getting their entertainment, television, making phone calls, you know, uh, taking pictures, all these things are changing. Uh, rapidly and dramatically, and it is useful to people, I think, to have some of this explained to them. I think of myself in some ways as a subcontractor. People have subcontracted to me the task of testing a bunch of this stuff and from a normal person's perspective trying to give them a sense of what's it like to use it, does it work as promised, and that sort of thing. But actually, this kind of journalism is uh, very popular across many publications and not only in technology but in other fields. We've been very successful at the journal with columns on health, with columns on uh, uh, investment and other topics. So people are looking for advice. So from your own experience, uh, is there a printed newspaper in 10 years? 
You know, I don't know the answer to that. It, it's, it's certainly, it certainly is changing faster than I would have said three years ago. Uh, part of that is hastened by the economic, the overall economic climate, but um, the point isn't uh, to save newspapers or to save television stations. The point is that we're we need to have journalism and journalists, and it doesn't matter to me if people are reading me on a screen uh, or on a dead tree. It just doesn't matter. What's the difference in the number of visitors you get? in the newspaper and on the website? Well, I don't know the answer on the newspaper because it's very difficult uh, to make. I mean, I know the circulation of the paper. Two million. It's about two million, yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how many of those two million people read my column. Uh, uh, the traffic is res quite respectable on the web and uh, uh, it's much more easily measurable as well. Uh, and. Uh, I would guess that partly because I am writing about technology, I probably get a higher percentage of people than some other journalists might uh, reading me on the web as opposed to reading me in print. What kind of a column gets the most response? Uh, columns that uh, touch on brand new, much anticipated products, and I would have to say uh, especially brands that have tremendous loyalty among people. So a new BlackBerry, anything new from Apple, uh, they tend to have tremendous interest because they have very passionate customers. And there are, I'm sure I'm leaving out several other companies like that, but. Um, well, I, from reading, I can remember a, a, a column I read some time ago on snagfilms.com all documentaries all the time and free. Uh, you have right. any idea, I know you wrote about it before it was even rolled out. Do you have any idea how they've done? I actually literally got an email today from them. It's their first anniversary tomorrow or today or something and I think they feel like they, they're doing pretty well. I, don't, I mean, I have no idea if they're making money or what their you know, financials are, but uh, I think they've managed to distribute uh, hundreds of films in the last year. I noticed they have advertising on there now. That's the, Steve Case is involved in that. And, it's and uh, Ted, Ted Leonsis, Ted Leonsis you know, who were all involved years ago. And, At AOL, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about, I, I can feel your uh, excitement when you do something like the uh, iPhone 3GS. I mean, you can get a sense that you're really, are, are you as excited about it as you write? And what? Yeah, I'm very excited about I'm very excited when technology uh, produces something uh, new and useful for pe for average people, and that's beautifully designed. And I think the iPhone falls in the category, but not only the iPhone. I'm excited about was excited about the Palm Pre and the Android phones from Google. Uh, these are this is a new class of device that I think changes the way people live and work without requiring them to learn a lot of techie stuff, and that always gets me excited. So I think that's a, a really a really important category right now, and I thoroughly enjoy writing about it. If you could have uh, your way in technology and science and all that, where do you want all this to go? I want it to remain human-focused. I, I want it, just like I said to you a long time ago in that tape when I was wearing the bigger glasses, I still think uh, ease of use is the most important thing, uh, and I think it has to be human-centered, and I think uh, uh, having people's uh, uh, opinions, whose opinions we might not have been able to read in the old days or watch in the old days is really a treat. It's really a privilege. There are loads of smart people out there who don't happen to have a job at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or uh, uh, on C-SPAN, uh, and those people uh, uh, have a lot to contribute, and it's great. One of the reasons I do use Twitter is I'm interested in hearing what they have to say. Here's a brief 24-second clip showing a little bit of the Walt Mossberg personality. The story is really interesting because then, of course, it began, it's grown. Yeah. I mean, we were showing you some sort of negative numbers at first, but the truth is, what are you, 32 million now, or? 
Uh, we don't we don't release those numbers, but <laughs> but it is growing as it's you growing said, very yeah. very rapidly. Right, right. So yeah, I, I I'd, I'm going to say it's 32 million. Okay. So you um so you're you're those are the founders of Twitter talking about how many people follow them. What was your exasperation about? Oh, I think they should be. Uh, I, I didn't see any reason why they wouldn't say how many how many people follow them. I think people ought to disclose as much as 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 much as uh, is reasonable. And to me, that was a reasonable thing to disclose. Are you worried about the power of outfits like Google or Microsoft? Does that matter? Well, we have a lot of power centers in our society, and I worry about the power of uh, 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 companies that have a lot of, uh, whose products have a lot of uh, uh, control over our lives in certain ways, and or who we depend on uh, quite a lot. But uh, I also, um, you know, I worry about world hunger. I worry about the economy. I worry about the planet. Uh, I worry about politicians and and bankers and uh, people in the media as well having uh, uh, outsized influence sometimes and doing the wrong thing. So just me, Walt Mossberg personally, I, I worry about a bunch of stuff like that. How much longer do you plan to do this? Uh, I have no plans to stop doing it uh, uh, unless the journal uh, decides that I should stop doing it and I've had no indication that they feel that way. So uh, I'm going to keep doing it as long as people keep reading it, and at the moment they are. Do you have any idea what your next column will be about? I have some idea, but I'm not going to tell you. And why is that? Because I tend not to broadcast what I'm going to do next in advance. And can you remember the worst kickback you got since you've been doing this since 91 from any manufacturer? Tick there have been a couple that have tried to get me fired. Uh, it hasn't happened recently, but toward the beginning, when it was a newer phenomenon to have somebody like me reviewing their products, there were, there were a couple that tried to get me fired. Uh, and uh, I actually didn't even find out about those cases till much later, because editors in New York just, you know, uh, refused and, and didn't tell me about it till later. Well, Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal, we thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Brian. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.